Thank you, Julie. Uh, Pranamda, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for those who are joining us this afternoon. Um, we've got a fantastic presentation on choosing and implementing a risk management framework. Um, I'm going to introduce you to the presenter in a moment, but just like to thank you all for coming in this afternoon and hopefully you can all hear us clearly. There will be um, a Q&A button on the screen. You can jot down any questions during the presentation and I'll be reading them out to Andrew at the end then. Um, so over to Andrew, just before um, Andrew starts his presentation, just give you a little background about Andrew. Andrew Prothero uh, is Director of Risk and Resilience at PCR Global. Uh, Andrew's experience has been formed by working on quality, health, safety, security and environmental projects as an employee, consultant and auditor around the world. After being involved in a number of complex ambush attacks as both a team member and a personal protection officer in the Middle East, in 2008 Andrew developed an obsessive interest in leadership and decision making. This widened Andrew's interest for security to risk management in a broader context and today he supports many companies in multiple disciplines over numerous industries. Andrew holds a master's qualification in security and risk management, health, safety, environmental management, and is both chartered safety and health practitioner with IOSH and chartered quality professional with the CQI. Andrew is also a fellow of the IIRSM and the Institute of Leadership and Management. Andrew's highlights that his experience of working across industries and operational, tactical and strategic roles and has guided his decision making which follows the principles of risk management within the areas of health, safety, security, environment and quality. With a desire to, to promote best practice over the minimum legal requirements, Andrew is an active third party uh, ISO lead auditor of risk management standards and has undertaken audits in Afghanistan, China, Dubai, Egypt, Gibraltar, Iraq, Nigeria, Oman, Singapore, Sri Lanka, Somalia, South Africa, Tanzania and the USA. So pretty much all over the world there. So there's a wealth of experience and knowledge that Andrew's going to bring today. So I'll now pass you over to Andrew and I hope you enjoy the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Andrew. Thank you, Steve. You can hear me? Thank you very much. Well, thanks for that introduction, Steve. So today's webinar is choosing and implementing a risk management framework from an occupational health and safety perspective. I've put a collection of slides uh, together for you. That's uh, sort of, I want to try to personalize my delivery today based on my career experience. So one of the first things that I want to say is that risk is contextual. So anything I say today may be viewed differently from other people and vice versa. Risk, sort of like beauty, is in the eye of the beholder, as we say. So my sort of career history, for, so I joined the military when I was 21 and then since, so since that time I've become a certification auditor for risk management standards as Steve said and I'm specifically a consultant for ISO 31000 which is this, one of the standards that we're going to talk about today we're going to talk this alignment with 45001. So my involvement in risk management, I think it's important to, to get that across. So as you can see there, I've been involved in sort of um, situational risk management or physical risk management at the sharp end uh, for a number of years, working as a close protection officer in, in the Middle East and various other uh, countries, culminated in some executive protection, where I was one of the lead bodyguards for Mohammed Al Fayed in London for five years. That involvement and that journey has involved a number of complex attacks. The both two attacks that you can see here on the left, I was behind that vehicle when four gentlemen lost their lives. And that attack on the right hand side, that is actually my colleague and my friend who I got the position. And unfortunately, he was killed on his first day in work after I got him, but after I got him the position. So there's a couple of sort of mantras I go by. One of them is everybody's got a plan until they get hit or until you get punched in the face, as Mike Tyson used to say. And that's when it matters, because that's when everything changes. Here is one of the complex uh, attacks that I was involved in from uh, actually being attacked by the police or people dressed up as the police, I should say, uh, resulting in obviously my main vehicle there getting sort of taken out. Emergency preparedness and, and response, that's what I really come from. That's me on the left hand side teaching local nationals how to drive Humvees and doing advanced trauma medicine on the right hand side. But now, as I say at the top, I'm in the slow lane. I'm in the slow lane. It doesn't feel like the slow lane all the time. But now I travel the world. I'm very fortunate undertaking these, these audits, obviously, as well as managing so the risk management department of PCR Global here in South Wales. So planning and the facts of history, all of these standards, they require planning. And once, we, once something happens, we know it's a fact of history and you can't take that back. 
So I particularly like this, this statement here from Eisenhower, which is a plan is nothing and planning is everything. So whilst it's good to have a plan, it's the journey that you've got to, to that plan because you are going to change that plan more often than not um, when it sort of goes loud. So I've got a learned appreciation for what's called the incident timeline and risk management. And the incident timeline, if we can just take a look at that, using this diagram, three stages, generally recognized stages of an incident, that's the pre-incident, where seeds are left to germinate. This could be inadequate risk assessment, lack of resource, lack of competence. And then we have the incident. This is where it goes loud, something happens, that incident unfolds, and the company then it's going to go into the third stage where they actually respond. That post incident area is really important because we either learn from the incident or we don't learn from the incident. Some people will call that a creep in crisis. It's all about where are we having those seeds germinate in an organization? We've all got them. So the incident timeline, three questions I always like to ask myself, in which stage do we have least time? Well, ultimately, that's the incident stage. Which stage should we as an organization or individual spend more time on? That's the pre-incident stage. And are we sowing the seeds of a major incident, whether that's health and safety, security, environment, quality, whatever it is, are we sowing the seeds of that incident at the minute? And ordinarily, we are as organizations. And that's where the importance of risk management and the risk management framework comes in. If we have a risk management framework, then we have a guideline to follow. And that leads us into part one. So choosing the right risk management framework. And I'm going to come at it from a, a health and safety perspective with that comparison against ISO 31000, 2018. Well, the health and safety reasons why we do this, it just stands out. I mean, we can argue about these figures. These figures get published, but we can see there that there's the health, safety and welfare in work of people within United Kingdom needs more protection. That's what we are all here to do. And that's where we need that framework. So what is a risk management framework? Always a good place to start. The standard you can see on the right hand side there, that's been with us since 2009 and not many people actually know about that. That's vocabulary for risk management. Um, so when you look at that, according to that document, the risk management framework is a set of components. So these are elements that give us the foundations and also the organizational arrangements for designing, implementing, monitoring, reviewing, and controlling risk management. We have that first view there of what we probably most of us know about, which is that plan, do, check, and act. If we're looking for a framework, is there a silver bullet? Is, is there a one size fits all? No, there's not. There's multiple risk disciplines, as we can see, from health and safety down to business continuity, 22301. Crisis management, emergency management, supply chain, 28,000. Quality, as we know. So there is not a silver bullet. Right, at, Like I said, right at the start, it is very, very contextual. So from my learning is get the best framework you can, change it, make it fit your environment. Some general examples of... Uh, risk management frameworks there, the recognizable HSG 65, which is the HSE's sort of recommended um, management system for health and safety. We have ISO 45001, as we can see there, the harmonized structure. ISO 31000 that we're going to talk about a little bit more. And we also have the orange book. So the orange book is that is the management of risk, the principles and concepts from the actual UK government. And usually not many people are actually aware of that. We've also got the COSO framework that comes from the US. And we've got so sort of historical um, frameworks there from the Institute of Risk Management. So there are a number of frameworks out there. Choosing one, as I say, that needs to come down to the context. What does a framework need to be? Well, you can see there, usable across the disciplines, usable across industries, easy to understand, a trusted source, relatable. And if it can have international coverage, that's even better. Easy to understand is important for me there. I think my journey, which brought me sort of right back to the start. And risk management is about people. It's about engaging with people. It's about having plans. It's about basic management, actually. That's what it is about. So we need this to be relatable and easy to understand. This is where the Swiss Army knife comes in. And this is where I believe ISO 31000, the guidelines for management, managing risk. This is why, for me, after knowing the majority of these standards, I tend to come back to this standard. Ouch. 
So why aren't we just using 45,001? This is the Occupational Health and Safety Management System. It's what it's designed for. So why aren't we just predominantly going to focus on that? So let's just have a quick look, a little deeper look at 45. So on the left hand side, we've got 45. In the center, we've got 45,003, which is a really good standard in 2021, psychological health and safety at work. And on the right hand side, we've got a British standard, which is guidelines for the application. We've also got the British, British um, number of British standards that support the ISO 45,000 series. So now we can have a dip into these. According to 45, the purpose, and that's what we need to know, don't we? As practitioners, what is the purpose? What's our purpose? What are we doing day to day, week to week? The purpose of an occupational health and safety management system is to provide that framework. It's the framework for managing occupational health and safety risks and opportunities. If we change 45 with 14, we have environmental. Nine, we have quality. 22, 301, we have business continuity. So we can see it as a framework. We've got to get that into our minds. It's that concept. It is a framework for managing risk. On the right hand side, we can see the harmonized structure, which is the old high level structure, context, leadership, planning, support, operations, performance, evaluation and improvement. As far as 45,001 goes, the difference there is clause five, leadership and worker participation. So the purpose of 45,001, it is that framework and we can see the framework on the right hand side. Interestingly, while it does provide that framework, what it doesn't actually provide us is that clearly linked, when it's not clearly linked to the principles and process and specifically for applying risk management, we can see on the right hand side, we have the harmonized structure. It's a really good structure, but it doesn't, as I say, link back to those um, principles and also to the framework. So why don't we use 5002? This is another standard, a really good standard. It's a British standard. And this gives us guidelines for actually managing the risks and opportunities. This is a good standard, by the way. It's non-certifiable, but it's a good like guideline. And if we look at the difference within this, this, unlike 45001, it actually really does tell us about the different types of risks and opportunities. So in here, we really are talking about the risks to the management system. Remembering it's a system, a system of collection of interacting policies, procedures, and importantly, activities. So this standard, this British standard is good, but yet again, it doesn't give us that clear link to the framework, the principles, and a process for applying risk management. And this is where 31,000 is gonna come into this. So we could say to ourselves, but 31 doesn't follow the ISO harmonized structure. Does that really matter? Well, if we were to look at published document ISO IWA 31 2020, this is actually a guideline for using 31,000 within management systems. So it gives us that little guide. When we look at it, it does look quite complicated. It takes a little bit of time to get used to. All that is is a mapping exercise. It's a mapping exercise from ISO 31,000 on the left-hand side principles to the high-level clauses, as we, as we can see from the harmonized structure, context, leadership. If you had this document, it would become a little bit more clearer. But once you've got to realize the difference, you would then realize you would then go back to the logical understanding because it is really logical. This gives us probably the clearest understanding of what 31,000 is. It's the big three. On the left hand side, we have the principles. In the center, we have the framework. And on the right hand side, in the blue box, we have that risk management process. That is the process that I'm talking about. That is the process I myself personally take out and I apply that, whether it's HR, no matter what it is, I apply that process, that six step process. It's really, really interesting. On the left hand side, these are the principles, integration, structured, comprehensive. As we can read through them, we can see here in the center, we actually have that value creation and protection as well, which is really, really important. So let's focus now on that risk management process. So what am I saying? ISO 45001 has a high level structure. We know that the harmonized structure. ISO 31000 has the big three, one of them being this process. This process is really, really important. If you can just imagine from any health and safety perspective about managing health and safety risks, do we need communication and consultation? Yes, we do. Without that, it's going to fall down. The biggest difference between the two is that consultation 
involves feedback. Remembering a risk management process or any management process is about people first. And if we don't consult with people, if we sit in our bedrooms or sit in our home offices, if we don't involve people, if we're off on a jolly on our own, we are going to miss that all important feedback. Communication, top down, bottom up, middle out. We can call it what we want, communication, but consultation is the critical area there. Let's have another look, what's number two? The scope, context, and criteria. What that's telling us in this standard is we look at the scope, where is it covering? What are we covering? Projects, programs, disciplines, companies, what is it? Is it, fall, is it falls from height? Is it hand down vibration? Is it maritime security operators offshore? That's what we've got to work out. That will give us our context. That will give us our criteria. The criteria is the risk management criteria. If it's hand arm vibration, part of that criteria, we know it's going to be L140. We know there's going to be lots of guidance. We've got to hit that criteria, which then we can move into the actual risk assessment process. If you're new to this standard, you will recognize that this risk assessment process is different to what we're generally used to seeing in the health and safety world, the five steps, as as the HSC would recommend. But look at it, risk identification. Identify the risks, analyze the risks, evaluate the risks against the scope, the context, and the criteria. That's the powerful element within this. Then we move on into four, the risk treatment. We've got to come up with some type of risk treatment for that. What are we going to do? Are we going to manage the risks? Are we going to own the risk? Are we going to ensure the risk out? Ultimately, we decide that when we do the actual risk assessment process. Then we move on to five, recording and reporting. Two different items yet again. Recording something, it could be by video, it could be by documentation, but reporting, where are we reporting up? Are we reporting out? If you just look at that framework wrong, yeah, that framework already, this management process, I should say, already, you could probably identify areas within your own organization where some of those are missing. And once I click up, Number six, monitoring and review. I can guarantee you will recognize where that's missing. Monitoring. Monitoring is a discipline. It has to be done regularly. Review is a discipline. It's different to monitoring. When we're doing that review, we are collecting, we're gathering all that information, all that analyzed information, all the feedback from consultation, and we are reviewing it as a disciplined exercise. Management is disciplined. Risk management should be more disciplined. So there we have ISO 31000, the risk management process, the all important process. That isn't the framework that we're talking about. That is just the process, which is part of the framework. And it's an iterative process. That means it can start anywhere. We know full well we could do a review with, 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 and that's give us our entry point into the process. It's not one, two, three, four, five, six, start again. It can be from scratch, but ultimately, once you start ongoing, then you can join it at any stage. A quick look at the history. So why is this standard so good? On the left hand side there, 1995, that's the first iteration of 31,000. When we look through it, if we look under section one, we've got the scope. We can recognize that from what we just looked at. Section two, the purpose, the policy and management review actually mentions management review, which we recognize from the ISO standards. Section three, the main elements, and then section four, we are now looking at what is now the risk, six steps of the risk management process. The context, identification, analysis, treatment, monitoring, and review. Recording and reporting, we could notice, is not there. In the center, we have the 1999 iteration, and then on the right-hand side, we have the 2004 iteration. It then became, in 2009, ISO 31000. And ISO 31000 2018 is the newest version of the standard. It's got a number of supporting guidelines as well and other standards. We can see on the left hand side, you can download that online because it's so old now, you can just find it online. Code of practice and guidance for the implementation. All we would have to bear in mind there, that's the 2011 and talks with the 2009 version, not the 2018 version. A very good document. PDISO TR 31004. That's a quite a large document. Again, it guides us on the implementation of 31000. And probably one of the least known, but I would say one of the most interesting 
um, standards, BSE NIEC 31010, risk assessment techniques. So there's multiple techniques. There's about, about 43 techniques in there. And if you think about a standard organization, um, they're going to have probably a five by five or a three by three matrix. And that's probably the only way they think they manage risk. If you go into that document, you will see multiple other methods. So what did we choose to help us implement? We, choose, we chose, I should say, ISO 31000, risk management guidelines. That is the choice. But we can, as I said at the start, take from other methods as well. We can learn from other methods. Don't be shy of taking those techniques because risk is contextual, as we say. Back to the orange book. If you look on the right hand side, continual improvement is in the middle. Plan, do, check, act. Continual improvement. We've got risk treatment, monitoring, reporting, risk, risk identification. One of the, some of the different wording in there, we've got 12 o'clock, we've got governance and leadership. Governance is really important. Governance, assurance, it is that top level taking control. Many organizations, whilst they'll have a senior management structure, they actually will have weak governance. They're all expecting somebody else to do it. Integration is, is important. That's the same for any uh, risk management standard. We should integrate it across all business processes. And what I like about this one, again, it talks about collaboration. That is that communication, consultation, and involvement. We have to involve all of our staff where we can, all of our senior leaders team where we can. We can't do this on our own. We are going nowhere if we try to do it on our own. So what else can we take from the orange book? Risk ex escalation, consolidation, and aggregation as well. What can we borrow? Department level risk assessment. At your own, your own all, all organizations have various um, departments. They'll certainly have strategic, tactical, and operational concepts. What can we borrow? Department level risk assessment. So that can be done, as it says, the department level. Consolidated enterprise risks. So we could have that overarching um, risk assessment that covers the whole organization. That includes internal, external. It's, it includes our stakeholders. Slightly leading into supplier risk management, it is mentioned. And then the review of those principal risks. Back to the six steps of 31,000 risk management process. Remember, monitoring and review. Not enough people review. Risk and management is two separate words, remember. Management means that. It means managing. We can borrow this very good visual representation. A bow tie. Some people would recognize that at the bow tie. Look at the center. You can see the knot. That is the event. Look at the left. We've got the cause. And it moves into the event and moves into the consequence. When I was in Iraq, I used to use these quite a lot for bonnet briefs. What can we borrow? Definitely that, a bow tie approach and also a visual representation as well. Especially when we are trying to involve senior management. There's nothing worse than going through a risk register in, with a senior leadership team. They get bored very, very quickly. If we can do a couple of exercises, a couple of workshops, focusing with bow tie, it does, it does really bring it out and it gets that buy-in. That is what we're after, buy-in. We can also borrow this visual on the three lines of defense approach. Now, if you go anywhere on LinkedIn, you will have somebody knocking this down. If you go, if you go, if you go to the pub, you'll have somebody knocking you down for something. There's always somebody who's going to have a different view. Risk is contextual. Do not be a sheep. Don't follow everybody. Take the best bits you can for definite. For me personally, when I apply that and I put that into organizations, I have done on numerous occasions, this is probably one of the best concepts at ISO audit. So when an ISO auditor then comes in and you have the front line talking about the first line, you have the second line, which is going to be your security department, your health and safety department, your quality department, who are overseeing the first line, and then you have your third line. That is the concept of internal audit. And you can see the important part there it is reaching past the senior management. So if you do have any blockers, and we do have blockers in organizations, of course we do, that internal audit should be set up to get the information right up to the top. So we can certainly borrow those. Some people will mention a fourth line of defense and they will include your external auditing body in that. PCR Global, we actually act as that fourth line of defense for organizations because we go in and we review this. So we act as insurance. So we can certainly borrow that. 
guidelines, ISO 31000 risk management guidelines, assigning organizations' roles, authorities, responsibilities, and accountabilities. I put that slide in there. That is where the majority of this falls down. Look at the right-hand side. It is virtually the same. Too often, people don't understand their role. If we think of the, the six management system standards for stress, role, role is in there, change is in there, responsibilities, authorities. I really like that term there, authorities, because a lot of the time we're responsible, but we don't have the authority to change things. What else are we borrowing from the book? Risk categories. Very often, if you're purely doing health and safety, your risk categories might be, I don't know, working at height. We might have a hierarchy of control. But if you look at this from the left-hand side there, property risks. So risks arising from property deficiencies, we know that is a health and safety criteria. And also on the right-hand side, security risks. Especially with the Protect Duty, Martin's Law, slowly starting to come in. This is an important area. So risk categories, we're thinking health and safety risk management, we're utilizing 31,000 because it's wider and we're taking something out of the orange book. So a little bit of a reflection there on, on, on part one. So choosing a risk management framework, 31 is used in support of 45, in support of 14 and nine. 31,000 has those has specific arrangements for that risk management. That's the principles, the framework, and the process. And it's also got those supporting standards that we looked at. Elements from other standards can be integrated. We did look at that also. So moving on to part two. Part one, we just had a look, an overarching look. We looked at 45,000, we looked at 31. We know we could use it in support. But then at some stage, we've got to implement it. This is probably the hardest part. And I can implement anything sat at this chair. I can implement something sat upstairs in my bedroom. But if I'm trying to implement something across an organization, even my own, I need involvement. Otherwise, I'm just shouting into an echo chamber. And it's, I, it's my voice I'm going to hear coming back all the time. This is the most difficult part, implementing. And this is where the framework from 31,000 comes into its own. What is a framework? Decide where we are. Gap analysis, that's what we're going to look at. Apply a change management approach. Apply a project management approach. Reminding ourselves that 31,000 has that guidance built into the standard. So a couple of those areas now we're going to look at. A risk management framework, we can see it on the right-hand side. Leadership and commitment is in the center. Without that, we might as well pack up and go home. There's another look now before we go into it of those, the big three, as I call them, the principles, the framework and the process. That's the integration of these. Moving closer now into the actual framework itself. So leadership and commitment, we just mentioned it. Without that, we are getting nowhere. So we need a mandate, don't we? We need a mandate from the senior management team. We are going to undertake this process. People are gonna be assigned. Timelines are gonna be assigned. Roles and responsibilities are going to be assigned and integration. We're going to integrate this, like we said earlier on, across all departments, if and when we can. Really important. Same for health and safety, as we'll see uh, in a moment. The design stage. This is absolutely critical. The majority of the ISO standards have a design element in them. Many organizations will look at the services, if they're a service organization, they will say, well, I don't do design. Can I take the design clause out? I think this is it's a dangerous area, especially with the security companies. Well, you do design. You design your route from Mogadishu International Airport out into the red zone. You design your route from Basra Airport up to Baghdad. So you are designing. We're always designing. This is a critical area, again, with the right people in. So the design stage on any ISO standard or any process in your organization is really, really important. On to the implementation, where we are implemented into the, into the organization. When we move on to five, that is that PDCA. This is where we can evaluate how are we going? Where are we going? Milestones, project management mentality, project management methodology. We need those milestones. It is just a route. It's a route to somewhere. And when we're on that route, at any time, we should be willing to veer off or even turn around. Sometimes you've got to turn around. And improvement. 
plan, do, check and act. That's it. We're reviewing how well are we going? What do we need to do? Frameworks are important without a shadow of a doubt. And we can see how that framework there comes together. So the first thing I said we're going to have to do is a gap analysis. So where are we? If we don't know where we're going, any road is going to get us there. Most organizations, believe it or not, are at this stage, especially at the tactical and operational level. The directors, the CEOs, COOs, COOs, CAOs, whatever they want to call themselves, are generally, they know where they're going, um, but it's not, not usually planned out and delivered lower down so people who are actually steering the boat there actually know which direction we're going in. Really important. So that gap analysis, what we're going to look at when we do that. This is probably one of the strongest areas that um, PCR Global are involved in when we look at the technical detail. Core processes, look at the core process, look at across your projects and across your programs. We've got to do that gap analysis against, against core processes, projects, programs, and also against the 45,001 harmonized structure. Because remember, at the end of this, we want to satisfy 40, 45,001, but we want to do it with the ethos of 31,000. So it all starts with a gap analysis. In considering the risk management context, we've really got three contexts in an organization, internal, external, and the risk management context, which overlaps definitely with the both of them. And it's gonna be different for all organizations. The risk management context for PCR is different to your organizations. Unless there's any of my competitors on you, then we're gonna be in the same. So where to apply, as we've just said, the core functions, projects, programs, and 45,001. So let's have a look at those core functions. Operations, marketing, HR, finance, and then we have supporting functions at the bottom, usually purchasing security, IT, health and safety, and always some type of facilities. If we understand our organization by understanding those, those depictions there and those four core functions and supporting functions, this is where we now know we have to apply that risk management process. That context, I was just said, is, is absolute, absolutely critical. This is the standard. This is what the standard tells us, the internal, external, and the risk management context. Let's look at that internal context for consideration. The vision, mission, and values of an organization. We need to know where we're going, but we've got to have values. We've got to have ethics as well, and everybody needs to be aligned with them. The organizational structure, roles, and accountabilities, like we said, strategy and objectives, and all the all-important culture, whether that's a risk management culture in this context, health and safety culture in other contexts, but really important. Our policy standards and guidelines not don't always have to be written down, of course, but if you do codify them and you do get people to sign up for them, then at least, at least, you know, you know, you can go back and look at that mandated policy standard or guideline. Our capabilities and resource continuously looking at who is doing our work for us. Do they need help? Do they need to go on additional course? Do they need internal training? Very, very important. Relationships, perceptions, values, again, the expectations of stakeholders. Everybody who uses PCR has an expectation. I have an expectation of IIRSM. IIRSM has an expectation of me delivering this today. Expectation is a big thing, and it's not nice to be let down when we've got expectations. Contractual relationships and commitments, they go without saying, don't they, but often overlooked. Interdependencies and interconnections. This is really that soft, that soft element of the internal context where you are relying on things. And if you pull, it's like, is it Complunk or whatever it was, or Buckaroo, you pull something out and it all goes wrong. We just need to know what those interdependencies are. And we move into the external context in which the organization, again, we're seeking, it's all about objectives. Pestle analysis, political, economic, social, technical, and environmental, at the international or regional level, or even at the project level, what is the external context? Very, very important. Again, networks and dependencies, again, contractual requirements, again, relationships. So there's a number of areas on the external context that do overlap. But we are realistically on the left hand side there, 2100 hours, key drivers impacting our objectives. Risk management is all about managing objectives, about achieving our objectives, whether that's from a health and safety standpoint, security environment, so on and so forth. What are the key drivers impacting them? 
Some people say, don't worry about your competitors. Don't look at them. Of course, you should look at your competitors. But of course, you should look internally as well. Another model, Porter's Five Forces model, is a really good model. We haven't discussed it in here, but it just came into my mind. That really does look at the key drivers. And then we have that all important risk management context. We have to establish these with the internal and external. So it's critical. It really is critical. Let's look at that context now from a 45,001 perspective. Understanding the organization and its context. Is a written process required? No, from a 45,001 um, standpoint. You don't need to document it, but it's beneficial. We've got to consider those three contexts. We've got to consider a PESL and a, PESL and a SWOT. Remember that SWOT analysis, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, is how we how we are doing against that, that, that PESL, you could put it that way. What are our strengths? Again, workshops. We should be doing workshops on this involving everybody. And then four, two, understanding the needs and expectations of workers and interested parties. Considering those legal requirements, it's good to document our interested parties. And I like number three there that I've written in, a power and interest matrix for interested parties is really, really beneficial. If you sit down and you actually jot down the power and interest that organizations have over you, you will very quickly align where you need to be looking at to ensure that you achieve your own objectives. And also then the scope. The scope of the system is important. Go back to that scope, context, and criteria of the risk management process. Define where we are. So many people don't do this. They get, that's why projects go wrong. Where are we going? Where are our boundaries? What's included, but importantly, what isn't included? We need to know that. Does the scope need to include or can be controlled and what can be influenced? Yes, if it's 45,001. And then that 4.4 management system, that's the entirety when we look at the context, the context clause, which is made up of four sub clauses. It needs to follow PDCA, we've mentioned it, and we've got to demonstrate that continual improvement. So we've just compared the 31,000 and the 45,000 context, and they are very similar. Remember, we're looking at the application, the implementation of a risk management framework. We need to take certain approaches to this. Definitely a change management approach. A lot is written on change, uh, on change management. Not many organizations formalize a change management approach to, within, within, within their own businesses. They don't do it. Personally, I, if I'm working with an organization who is really interested in managing the risk, the quality, environmental safety risks internally, we will have a formal management of change process. And this is the, the change that I use. It's a six step process, flag change, change review, change approval, information update, get your training in, and then get that implementation in. Organizations who I've supported have used formal change management process for those big changes, really do benefit from it. So not just a change management approach, a project management approach. This is really critical. I done my prints too, I think in 2013. That is a, a right eye opener. It's looking at those themes, those processes and those principles um, uh, from a project management perspective. There are multiple types of project management courses that we can do, but ultimately they do come back to the similar, similar elements. They have principles, they have themes, they have processes, starting with the business case. With a project owner, there's a quality theme throughout it. There's a risk theme throughout it. And that all important managed by stages. Managed by stages, milestones, like we said just now, about let's get to that service station. Let's get to that next service station. Let's get back to that junction. Then we can have a discussion. Are we going in the right direction? Really, really, really important. This is where companies do fall down. Risk classification. This is a, a really important area. We did sort of touch on it earlier on. If we look at the book on the right hand side by Paul Hopkin, there, he talks a lot about compliance, hazard, control, and opportunity risks. For health and safety, we're basically talking about those uh, hazard risks. But ultimately, if you view your organization through lenses such as this, then it will make risk management easier. It'll make it more communicable internally. People will understand it more because we talk about it more. Bullet point four, opportunity. That's that speculative risks. So risks do have, as we know, a threat and an opportunity. And there we go. We're borrowing again. Remember, it is contextual. We're not, we're not going to be given 
risk management, manage your company to success by numbers. Like we used to have those painting by numbers. We ain't going to get given that. We have to have the versatility. We have to be able to have the foresight to put this thing together, not in our bedrooms with everybody else. Really, really important for the framework. And that policy, that all important policy, we need the mandate from senior management because that gives us the handrail, doesn't it? It gives us a handrail, direction. We look at the key stakeholders. What resources do we need? What risk criteria? Back to that classification. So there's a number of elements on there. Right at the bottom, how progress against the policy will be monitored, reviewed, reported and communicated. Really important, that monitoring, that reviewing again, because we don't want to get too far down the M4 and we're looking back and thinking, do you know what, which junction was I supposed to get off at? We need to know where we're going. And it's really, really important to do that. Part three, the final part. Um, so personal application, application considerations through my own experience of dealing with organizations. And more recently in the last four years, applying some of these principles within PCR Global as well. So what, 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 what hits home for me? Risk leadership this is all about leadership and good leadership leads to discretionary effort that's that extra mile aubrey daniels his sort of definition discretionary effort is the level of effort people could give if they wanted to but it's above and beyond the minimum requirements and that discretionary effort that go in the extra mile we're only going to get that if people are bought in so we were looking at our transformational leadership when we're looking into people our servant leadership, and we are actually leading to serve the people. Really, really important. Transactional, carrot and stick, not so much anymore. Autocratic, not so much, but all leadership styles have a place depending on where we are. But from a risk management perspective, when we think of leadership, we can just go back to situational leadership. And that is dependent on the maturity of the followers that we've got. So we're applying our leadership style to the actual followers. And remember, if you haven't got any followers, you're not a leader. Management functions. This is critical. It's a critical area and this applies to leaders as well. Let's have a look at the basic management functions. If we take out staffing, we are then into Henry Fiol's original management functions that he came up with over 100 years ago. So competence, understanding and application. Much smoother when we have skilled managers and mature management functions. Planning, we have to plan. A lot of managers don't really understand what planning is. They can't articulate, they couldn't write it down. But look how that, look at the flow there. We plan, we're saying where we're gonna go, we're identifying where we're gonna go, and then we have to organize. So a management function of organizing is so, so important. Again, timelines, internal, external involvement. Think of yourself as a, as a manager, think of yourself for, or, or, a, or a director or a leader or whatever you want to call yourself. If you can't plan, if you don't plan, you won't organize. When we're organizing, we need the right staffing. These are the right people involved with the right recruitment, selection, training, the right individuals, and then over to directing or leading. That takes us back a slide into um, Aubrey Daniels is discretionary effort. Which leadership style are we using? And then on to controlling. So controlling, it sounds it sounds quite negative, but it's not, is it? It's just making sure that is the actual review and the monitoring part. So management functions, your management team being skilled with mature understanding of how this all works will assist the implementation of a risk management framework. The line of sight. So the line of sight, again, is um, from my own personal experience. Some of you may remember this statement. There are no knowns. There are things we know we know. We also know there are known unknowns. That is to say, we know there are some things that we don't know, but there are also unknown unknowns. The ones we don't know, we don't know. And this is Donald Rumsfeld speaking just before the Iraq war in 2003. If we consider what he's just said, he does cover three quadrants, but he does miss a quadrant. So no knowns. So senior management is aware and the outcomes are quite predictable. That's the line of sight. If we look across to number two, the known unknowns, senior management are aware, but the outcomes are, can be highly predict unpredictable. And then if you look at the unknown unknowns, then basically these are, these are things that none of us know yet. And that I think was Mr. Rumsfeld, one of his reasons why we actually went. But what he misses out on 
which really becomes apparent in organizations when you're an auditor, is that those facts that are known by lots of people in the organization, but not known by the senior team or the people who are the decision makers. And it's that line of sight that we've got to get to. And it really does stand out for me. You see, probably may have seen the iceberg of ignorance used and the percentages in that, they're not going to be accurate. An understandable concept. At the strategic level, people are planning, they're securing contracts, they keep people in work, but they're not often on the ground. The control activities, generally at the tactical level, this is the management, they are directing and controlling people on the ground, but then the operational, um, and I've spent most of my career on an operational level, we are always on the ground, we're always at the sharp end, and that's where accidents, incidents generally happen, it's down there. So we need that line of sight. If we're going to apply a risk management framework, we need to see from the strategic, tactical and operational, and we need to be involved in all three of those areas as well. Perception and decision making. Um, just remind ourselves where, where we are sort of in this delivery. These are what I've, my experiences of where this goes bad or where this goes um, well. Perception and decision making. We've got to understand the decision making process of everybody within our organization and those outside the organization as well. The top-down psychological processes, the memory, knowledge, expectation, and experience, and the bottom-up as well, sight, sound, smell, touch, and taste. And they're gonna meet in the middle, aren't they? They're gonna meet in the middle. That's the focus point. This is where we interpret what is going on around us. But once we interpret it, we can perceive it. We're now starting to understand it because we are then gonna make a decision based on those processes. So having an understanding of the decision making, and I should say, having a consideration of the decision making processes for everybody else will assist us in our implementation, because the decisions that we make can save life without a shadow of a doubt. Another slide on that sort of decision making process, each and every one of us, we have a thought process, what leads into it is situational, it's based on our own perceptions, our own hazard identification, our own risk assessing ability. Shall I raise a safety concern? Will I get listened to? And then that goes into our risk decisions. We're looking at the risk decision just using a different slide. Let's focus on that risk decision. That risk decision itself is built on uncertainty and bounded rationality. And that bounded rationality is basically the information that we have. We can't have access to all information. So we, we are always generally always, I'm certainly me anyway, making a decision um, without all of that information. If I had more information, I could probably make a better decision. And let's have a little look at that uncertainty because that's what's holding up our decision. And that uncertainty itself is broken down generally into two areas, aleatory and epistemic. Aleatory uncertainty is that more information cannot be gained. It, ma it matters not how deep we dig, we will not get any more information. And remember, one of the principles of risk management is that information. That's information history, information currently, and what we expect to happen in the future. And then we have that epistemic where more information can be gained with further inquiry. And it's really important. This is, this is really important, especially as a, a manager, a program manager, a director, is when you have people, dare I say it, working for you, don't want to say underneath you when they have people working for you you need to know that they, they have they have all the information that they've gone as far as they can really important that i sort of term there as situational risk management the risk management workbook this is something that i've used probably with about six or seven organizations very successfully um, one or two of those organizations it petered out after a while and that's because they just chose just to not use it and, and remembering we've got to try and stay on, on track with this. So department risk management workbook. This is an Excel sheet. If you look down the bottom, we've got a RACI matrix, we've got objectives, we've got interested parties, compliance obligations, risk register. So ultimately this, this going back to what we said about the setting it as a departmental level, departmental objectives register. If your departments know what their objectives are formally, it does assist the action that we need to get there the responsibilities of, of people who are doing it. So a risk management workbook, you could have an, app, an implementation workbook. A risk register, we mentioned earlier on about at the 
at the departmental level. Now, many people will look at that. You can't have five by five. That doesn't work. We've all read LinkedIn. But ultimately, my personal view, remember this is my personal view, providing you explain to people the weakness in the risk assessment process, the weakness in five by fives, whatever, however many by however many. Personally, if you explain it, it's it certainly does make up for the short falls. And it's how you describe your risks. Personally, cause, risk, consequence, as you can see there in the risk description areas. Your management workbook could have that issues register. Very important that people are, are able to highlight those issues. We're nearly there. The main barrier to implementation. So we looked at 31,000. We talked about how it relates to 40. Um, 5,000 and, we, and how we can apply 45 by using that standard, 31,000. There is one main barrier, uh, there's a many barriers, but there's one main barrier to implementation of any management system. And that is the inability of people to speak out. If people can't speak out, if they can't give and receive feedback, as we say, if they can't raise issues and concerns, and I am going to read them all out because it is important. If you can't, if they can't disagree, if they can't ask for clarification, if they can't ask difficult or testing questions, if they can't ask us for help, if we can't, if we don't offer solutions to problems, and if they can't admit errors, then there's an issue because people will not speak up. And we need everybody to be on board to apply this. We don't just need the senior leadership team. Of course we do, because they're going to mandate it, because it's going to take time. But ultimately, the success of this with with really good you know a, a really good mandate still depends on the individuals like i said at the start safety at its first wrong risk and safety at its very core are people subjects so a reflection and close so 31000 management standard it does give us the big 3 the principles the framework and it gives us a process for implementing a robust occupational health and safety risk management framework. It certainly friends its best mates with 45,001. They use better together. And that's it. Thank you very much uh, for listening. Decisions, as I always like to tell people, or those who are willing to listen for more than five minutes, decisions cost lives and livelihoods. And facts of history can be painful, painful reminders. reminders. So we'd always we'd somewhere always in the incident timeline. Stay safe, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay productive. Where we can, don't trust it. Excellent. Thank you, uh, Andrew. It's a superb presentation. I hope you'll all agree. Uh, I'm going to move um, straight on to questions and answers, if I can, just to give everybody a bit of a chance to uh, have their say. Um, we've got one question from Alan. Um, for the management function slide, where would training, knowledge and competency sit? Within, I think, in all of them. In, in each of those management functions, Alan, if you look back at Henry Fayol's work, and you read through it, and Mary Follett, where she sort of picked up from that. At each one of each one of those areas, and I'm just reading what you've said there. Training, knowledge, and competence is going to sit in in each area without a shadow of a doubt. I can't hear you there, Steve. If you're speaking, apologies. Um, yeah, if um, anybody else has got any other questions, they'd like to raise their hands or type it in the chat bar. Um, we'll give you another minute or so to do that before we wrap things up. Um, just on on your presentation, I had one question, if that's all right, Andrew. Um, with regards to gap analysis, you know, at the start of the process, you obviously need to know where you're at to know where you want to go, like you mentioned the process. Is there any specific tools or do they recommend anything in uh, 31,000 uh, guidance on how to do that gap analysis around risk management or is it down to you to interpret that towards what your organisational organisation does? Definitely contextual. And th th what, what we tend to find when we do a gap analysis, an organization will engage us. And when we go in, due to sort of our experience in the areas and what we've seen in other organizations, it generally leads to the senior management team thinking, do you know what, that might be an idea, that might be a better idea. So generally though, the organization themselves is gonna to be to a particular standard usually. And uh, dare I say it, a lot of the time it's because it's needed in a tender. There's not that many people wanting to apply risk uh, 31,000 on its own. 
it's yeah. generally linked to a, a different standard, Steve. Okay, yeah, great. No, thanks for clarifying that. For me, it's uh, useful, um, definitely an eye opener. And um, again, thank you again for your presentation. Um, I had one other thing just to mention relating to the WIRSM Wales branch that we've had um, a couple of people put their names forward to be committee members, which I'll be in touch with them shortly to try and um, boost our committee side of the, the Wales branch. And if anybody else is interested, please come forward and let me know either on LinkedIn or through the WIRSM Wales branch on the website. Um, but if that's, that's it from everybody else, I think. Thank you again, Andrew, for your presentation. Been brilliant speaker as always. I'll catch up with you soon. And thanks everyone for attending today. So all the best. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.